It's the airplane design for the end of the world. Kept deep in the American Highlands and kept ready 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, for specially designed aircraft lie in wait for the moment everything changes. They're not meant to drop bombs, they're not meant to ravage enemy bases, and they're not meant to fly VIPs, or at least not usually. They're a fleet uh, with exactly one single purpose, to provide a command post for the highest leaders of the American military in the event of nuclear war. If all goes wrong, if the klaxon sirens roar to life, it'll be the Boeing-made US Air Force-operated E-4, the Night Watch, that takes control, and from that moment onward, the decisions made inside its fuselage will change the course of global history. The E-4 Advanced Airborne Command Post, or AACP, was born of the same moment in American history that saw a range of iconic military aircraft take to the skies for the first time, alongside the high-performance F-15 Eagle, the thundering B-1 Lancer, the tough-as-nails A-10 Warthog, and the gargantuan C-5 Galaxy. The AACP, better known today as the Night Watch, was developed and flown for the first time in the early 70s. A combination of newly available technologies on the American side and fears of highly advanced warplanes that might soon emerge from the Soviet Union have prompted a fleet-wide set of evolutions that's really only been duplicated since then with the advent of stealth aircraft technology. But when it came to the Nightwatch aircraft, the driving factor behind their conception wasn't just to do with beating some rival aircraft sent by Moscow. Instead, the issue at hand was a new threat the Nuclear Electromagnetic Pulse, or Nuclear EMP. EMPs refer to any massive blast of electromagnetic radiation, and they can come from natural phenomena like lightning strikes, the breakup of a meteor as it falls through the Earth's atmosphere, and coronal mass ejections, massive plasma bursts that eject from the sun and can sometimes wash over the Earth. They cause electrical interference that can temporarily or even permanently damage electrical systems if they're close enough to receive a blast of energy, and while minor EMPs like lightning have largely been dealt with when it comes to protecting modern hardware, major EMPs can cause fairly massive damage to electrical and electronic systems, buildings, airborne means of transportation like airplanes, and more. Since the early days of nuclear bomb testing in 1945, the United States was already aware that EMPs were a byproduct of nuclear detonation. But although they understood the presence of EMP bursts and their effects, they badly underestimated the scale of the EMPs that they could cause. The turning point came nearly two decades later, when, in July of 1962, America carried out a test called Starfish Prime. In that test, the US detonated a bomb of about one and a half megatons yield over the Pacific. They got a way bigger EMP than they had expected. In Hawaii, nearly a thousand miles away from the test, hundreds of streetlights were disabled and other minor but real electrical damage was recorded. That damage was fixed relatively quickly, but as the test results were analyzed, they painted a more and more foreboding picture. Luckily for America, Starfish Prime had taken place far from the continental US, in a zone where the magnetic field of the Earth exerted its strength only somewhat. But America's lower 48 states were another matter entirely. The Earth's magnetic field was a good bit stronger there, and if the same warhead used in Starfish Prime had been detonated at a similar altitude over the northern US, the effects would have been orders of magnitude worse. Design a nuclear weapon designed to create the largest high-altitude EMP burst it could, like the Soviets were almost certain to do once they did the same mathematical research America had just done, and America was screwed. According to a primer published by the Federation of American Scientists in the late 1990s, a large nuclear device detonated four to five hundred kilometers high over Kansas would fry the electrical grid, destroy most forms of modern technology, and send most, if not all, of the continental United States back to the industrial age. And not only could such an EMP by the Soviets be devastating, but it could allow them to gain a strategic victory very, very quickly, crippling America's defense apparatus and preventing a nuclear retaliation without a single death on either side. The Nightwatch wouldn't be the first aircraft that the US would build to provide an airborne strategic command post, but they would be a significant improvement on the stopgap aircraft America had put into the skies. The predecessor to the Nightwatch was the EC-135, based on Boeing's C-135 Stratolifter, and to its credit, the EC-135 was a capable platform for the time. In the 60s and 70s, it performed so-called looking-glass missions, with one aircraft flying at all times 24-7, 365, to command nuclear bombers and ballistic missile silos in the event that ground command centers were destroyed or made inoperable, but their data technology and lack of EMP resistance meant that they needed replacing sooner rather than later. 
To answer that call, the US Air Force went to Boeing, looking for a few copies of its biggest and most sophisticated aircraft at the time, the 747-200. Boeing happened to have a couple on hand built for a commercial customer who had ultimately decided not to complete their purchase, and by the end of 1973, the number was doubled to four. Now, because the Nightwatch uses the same frame as a commercial 747, its construction has less to do with an innovative airframe design and more to do with the interior. That's not to say that the plane underwent no changes on the outside. For example, the Nightwatch aircraft have a distinctive bulge a few dozen feet behind the cockpit. That's where they house a radome featuring a steerable satellite communications antenna with its more modern updates enabling communications with a constellation of military satellites in orbit. But the bulk of the work was on building the interior, enabling a massive crew of well over 100 people to maintain constant contact with the outside world and manage incredibly important strategic assets. The first of the aircraft took its inaugural flight in June of 1973, and by the time the third aircraft was delivered to the Air Force in 1974, the planes already had new engines. In 1979, when the fourth aircraft was finally delivered, it was the first to include that radome on the top behind the upper deck. This kicked off a change from the early model E-4A to the E-4B, and within a few more years, all four of the planes were E-4Bs outfitted with vastly improved communications ability and some serious hardening against electromagnetic pulses. Because of the rapidly evolving threat environment that these aircraft face, uh, they've never stayed internally stagnant for more than a couple of years at a time. But much of what goes on under the surface is kept classified. From the outside, the E-4B aircraft you might see in the skies today are almost totally unchanged from what they were four decades ago. But from what we do know about their internal systems, they've grown into very impressive beasts nonetheless. When it comes to the E-4B's basic specs, it's similar for the most part to the classical Boeing 747. With a full length tip to tail of 231 feet 4 inches or 7.5 meters, it boasts a wingspan of 195 feet 8 inches or a bit under 60 meters. Sitting empty, it weighs 410,000 pounds or 186 metric tons, and it's powered by four General Electric F-103 engines, each of which is capable of pushing out about 52,000 pound force of thrust. When it's pushing its limits to maximum speed, it can crest just over 600 miles an hour, 970 kilometers per hour or so, and it cruises at nearly the same speed, 566 miles per hour or about 900 kilometers per hour. On a single tank of fuel, it features a range of 7,100 miles or 11,500 kilometers, hitting a maximum altitude of 45,000 feet or 14,000 meters. With a few small discrepancies here and there, that puts the E-4B on par with the 747-200 across the board, or at least that's what it looks like. But as soon as we begin talking about the E-4B's internal modifications, it should be crystal clear that we're talking about a far more sophisticated piece of technology here. The change at the heart of the E-4B is its hardening against EMP bursts. All wiring on board is shielded from electrical disruption, all onboard equipment is heavily insulated, and although, according to public knowledge, this has never been tested, the aircraft should be able to withstand the sort of nuclear EMP burst that would see the rest of the United States totally crippled. The cockpit, too, is made to be invulnerable to EMPs, and as a result, it's foregone the upgraded glass cockpits of modern aircraft replete with shiny LCDs and other digital bells and whistles. Instead, the E-4B relies entirely on analog flight instruments, the old-fashioned way, making its own controls functionally impervious to electronic interference. And then there's the question of the aircraft's endurance. The Nightwatch is intended to receive in-flight aerial refueling, courtesy of the United States' prodigious tanker fleet, and it's not modest about its appetite. If it's being refueled by America's workhorse tanker aircraft, the KC-135, it'll take two full KC-135s to replenish the E-4B's internal fuel supplies just once. But in the event that the Nightwatch should ever have to fulfill its primary function, the presence of refueling tankers will be very, very important. The E-4B is designed to remain airborne for a span of up to a full week at a time, equipped with engines that can fire for weeks at a time and only become inoperable when their stores of lubricant run out. As long as the fuel keeps coming, the E-4B can keep flying, potentially providing thorough and complete coordination of what would be the worst days in US history, up to and including the world's first reciprocal nuclear exchange. 
And speaking of nuclear exchange, the aircraft has other features to guard against the consequences of warhead detonation. Its windows, though few and far between, are covered in a mesh that prevents electromagnetic shock waves from blowing them inward. And in the cockpit, the flight crew has access to specialized masks that will prevent the plane's operators from being blinded if nuclear explosions occur within their field of vision. And inside the aircraft, the Nightwatch carries the largest crew complement of any military aircraft in the entire world ever. The flight crew is a relatively modest brunch, including just a pilot, a co-pilot, and a flight engineer, as well as a navigator. But the mission crew, that's a whole other story. The E-4B contains the space and stations to operate with a mission crew of up to 108 people, including everybody from maintenance crews to onboard analysts and technicians to senior members of the US military. At the helm of it all is the battle staff, a team of planners, systems officers, administrative personnel, a handful of other experts, and the onboard chief. They're supported by the operations team, a group that works to process and synthesize data from up to 29 available onboard consoles at once. Also on board are the technical control team, who handle the aircraft's communication system and keep them connected, cooled, and reliable during flight. The layout of the Nightwatch aircraft is specially optimized to ensure that the full mission staff can function to its highest quality. The plane is organized into three decks, with the uppermost of the three including the flight deck for the pilot, co-pilot, navigator, and flight engineer, plus a lounge area and sleeping quarters for the flight crew and maintenance personnel. The middle deck is where the magic happens. It includes a nine-seat conference room, a projection room with EMP-insulated flat-screen displays, a briefing room where the battle staff does a majority of their work, an operations area where those 29 consoles and their associated switchboards, phones set up, and data hubs are housed, and a compartment near the aft of the aircraft, toward the tail, where the technical control team does its work. Toward the front of the main deck, the E-4B features a galley with freezers, refrigerators, ovens, and microwaves with the capacity for onboard stewards to serve many dozens of hot meals over the course of an extended flight. Toward the aft of the plane, the crew has access to a rest area to sleep and recuperate, with additional food storage, and the capacity for use in religious ceremonies. Also squeezed onto the main deck is a zone called the National Command Authority, or NCA. This basically amounts to an executive suite, a place to house the President of the United States of America, the Secretary of Defense, or in times of severe crisis, an acting or presumptive acting president. The suite contains a modest sleeping area, a lounge, an office, a dressing room, and a telecommunication suite to enable secure, high-quality communications from onboard the plane to anywhere across the world. In the event that the Nightwatch does carry the highest executive of the United States, the onboard briefing room is fitted with a lectern and the ability to prepare a broadcast video. The E-4B is also able to link to America's ground-based communications network, although that may be a somewhat less useful capability in the event that much of that network is fried. In all, the Nightwatch features 42 different communication systems, all at the President's fingertips in case of emergency. It can reach any landline or cell phone in the entire world, capture radio and television broadcasts, and communicate with any element of the US military at any time. The aircraft's lowermost deck is largely a functional space, equipped with water supply tanks that store enough to provide for a full flight crew across the length of a journey. Also on the lower deck are satellite communications equipment and a very low frequency or BLF radio transmitter. The aircraft is equipped with its own air stair to embark or disembark, including to enable easy access when landing in potentially suboptimal conditions. Elsewhere on the aircraft are power panels to control and manage interior power, plus an avionics suite, spare parts, and liquid oxygen converters. The E-4B's latest phased array antenna systems enable the aircraft to stream high volumes of high bandwidth voice data and video, linking with a range of military and commercial satellites under adverse conditions. And finally, there's the Nightwatch TWA, its trailing wire antenna. This is a five-mile-long antenna, usually held on a spool, that unfurls behind the aircraft. The TWA is essential for a function called Takamo, short for Take Charge and Move Out, which ensures the survival of critical communications links that can transmit between the National Command Authority, usually meaning the President, and America's triad of strategic nuclear weapon systems, its bomber fleet, its intercontinental ballistic missiles, and its nuclear-armed submarines. While the trailing wire antenna on most Carmo aircraft is especially vulnerable to EMPs, the TWA on the Nightwatch aircraft is hardened just like everything else on the planes. When in use, they're capable of penetrating salty seawater that renders most communications methods ineffective and sending signals to America's ballistic missile submarines, the 14 of the Ohio class and soon the planned 12 of the new Columbia class. Nor is the Nightwatch intended to function on its own, and nor does it have to. When in flight, the E-4B is capable of working with other Takamo aircraft, specifically the E-6 Mercury, 16 of which are in service to the US Navy. The Mercury fleet are intended basically as relay stations, receiving orders from the National Command Authority wherever that highest executive may be, including from the Nightwatch, and transmitting them to ballistic missile submarines at closer range. 
The Mercury Lion will be phased out by a successor aircraft currently designated the Lockheed EXX with a planned date of introduction late in this decade. They're also able to communicate with America's two VC-25s, each designated Air Force One, anytime they're fulfilling their iconic role carrying the US president. And while the Night Watch is not optimized to carry out battle management and tactical command and control functions like an advanced early warning and control aircraft, it can collaborate with America's aging E-3 Sentry and the incoming E-7 Wedgetail to unify both a strategic nuclear response to a threat and a potential parallel engagement involving conventional warfare assets. The Nightwatch O was introduced to service for the first time in 1974. At that time, and through to the 1990s, at least one of the four aircraft was continually stationed at Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland. There, one night watch at all times has been kept on alert, a practice that's continued since the four aircraft were transferred to Nebraska for full-time stationing by America's Clinton administration. An E-4B, kept on alert, is crewed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with a watch crew always on board to guard over its highly sensitive communications equipment. Other night watch crew on call are expected to remain on base and ready to be called by a base-wide launch alarm. Even though Nightwatch aircraft no longer stay at Andrews Air Force Base, a complete E-4B crew is always kept there on standby, with another located at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Luckily, the Nightwatch has never had to fulfill its primary mission role, and we, for our part, very much hope that that remains the case. But it's gotten a good amount of work done in the years since its introduction. For example, one night watch always flies back up with America's president, trailing behind Air Force One whenever it goes abroad for international travel, and often oh, when it moves to Alaska or Hawaii, far out of the immediate vicinity of the continental US where the night watch is based. There, the E-4B joins an airborne convoy of cargo and support aircraft and maintains the ability for the president to leverage a backup plane if need be. That way, even if something happens to Air Force One and the President is otherwise stranded abroad, they've got a fully capable National Command aircraft at their disposal. To that end, the Night Watch and Air Force One are never kept together when they're deployed. If Air Force One is kept at one airport, the Night Watch remains on standby at another. The decision to send the Night Watch fleet to Nebraska full-time was made after the introduction of the current pair of Air Force One aircraft, the VC-25s, which include much of the executive functionality of the E-4B and probably a whole lot else that we just don't know about. About. Rather than be used by the President most of the time, the Nightwatch aircraft are the primary planes charged with transporting the US Secretary of Defense on overseas trips with its onboard facilities expansive enough to allow the Secretary's staff to keep in constant contact with the US and continue coordinating on matters of defense at all times. Once the VC-25s took over presidential transport duties, there were enough E-4Bs freed up that one or two could be on loan to FEMA, America's Federal Emergency Management Agency. It's equipped to serve as a mobile command post in places where ground facilities are non-existent, damaged, or unsafe. One E-4B was also spotted above Washington, D.C. on 9-11 following the Al-Qaeda attack on the Pentagon building and prior to the attacks on the World Trade Center buildings. As for presidential flight, only Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan are known to have flown on the Nightwatch aircraft, at least officially. Yet despite the E-4B's obvious utility, not just in the event of a nuclear catastrophe, but as a highly valuable asset more broadly to the United States, it's also an aging platform. The Nightwatch celebrated its 50th anniversary in active service this year, making it older than about two-thirds of Americans, and replacement has been on the American government's mind for some time now. Although its onboard communication suite includes some very advanced pieces of kit, other Nightwatch systems have increasingly shown their age, and even the older Model 747 it's based on now leaves some to be desired. Talk of replacing the Nightwatch started all the way back in 2006, but although the first plane in the series was slated for retirement in 2009, that retirement still hasn't happened. A 2019 flood at Offutt Air Base didn't help matters either, severely damaging the E-4B's primary runway and leading to years-long relocations of in-flight and ground-based Nightwatch personnel that have made the current aircraft harder to fly and maintain. The anticipated replacement of the aircraft is currently referred to as the Survivable Airborne Operations Center, a program that's been ongoing since 2019. Intended to utilize significant off-the-shelf components and a far more digitized approach to systems construction, the new aircraft should go operational sometime in the early to mid-2030s. It'll be constructed and developed with the help of the Sierra Nevada Corporation, or SNC, an aerospace and electronic contractor that beat out Boeing for the role after Boeing refused to let go of its data rights to the airplane intended for use in the new platform, the 7478 Intercontinental. Despite Boeing's lack of involvement, the 7478i will still be the aircraft used for the plane. Rather than acquire new copies, Sierra Nevada has purchased five used models from Korean Air, an acquisition that might not make sense on paper when brand new models could be custom-built, but it actually has more 
more value than it seems. Unlike made to order aircraft, used aircraft are highly unlikely to have things like tracking devices, monitoring equipment, bugs, or anything else installed in hard to access or hard to detect places, since after all, people working on them had no reason to try and spy on what they thought would be a Korean air jetliner. The design of the new aircraft, especially the interior, is tightly controlled and buried under several layers of classification, but as per the US Air Force, it will fulfill largely the same broad role as, quote, a command, control, and communication center, directing US forces, executing emergency war orders, and coordinating the activities of civil authorities, including national contingency plans. Per the Department of Defense, the new aircraft may merge in summer capabilities with the E-6 Mercury fleet in order to integrate ICBM command and control into a platform that could communicate with the entire nuclear triad. In the coming years, the Nightwatch will attempt to pull off what has become the ultimate coup of a Cold War era aircraft. Like the hyper advanced F 22 Raptor and the formidable B 2 Spirit and several other advanced warplanes that were meant to bring America a victory against a fellow major power, the E 4B is just years away from ending its service life without ever serving the purpose it was made for. But far from a lack of accomplishment, far from an end result that only the lazy or uninspired would brag about, this is the goal for any aircraft with stakes so high as the Night Watch. Every day that the Night Watch goes by without having to assume control of a world-ending nuclear exchange is another day that America's defense apparatus and indeed the governments of the entire world have fulfilled most of their fundamental duty. Give it a few years and knock on wood a general lack of mushroom clouds and the E-4B Night Watch will have finally fulfilled its mission.